We're going to be talking about performance and limitations today, which is one of the uh, tasks in the private pilot ACS that you may be asked on your oral exam there. Um, so there's a lot of different subparts within performance and limitations. So we're not going to break apart every single little thing, but we'll talk about some of the more important ones. Um, so just as an intro here, my name is Wesley Chin. I'm a CFI at Princeton Flying School. I've been teaching here since last October. I also did all my certificates and ratings all at Princeton. So, you know, it's like took my check res and 298 Mike Charlie and all those planes there. Um, so when I'm not flying, I'm a student at Rutgers Business School studying finance. So I'm starting my junior year next semester. And let's see, I also teach uh, piano and saxophone at a local music school. So content for today, we're gonna to start off by talking about factors affecting performance. So again, if you take a look at the ACS for this task, there's like, I don't know, maybe eight or nine different things under factors affecting performance. So we're not gonna break apart every single little thing, uh, but we'll talk about some of the more important ones, which include atmospheric conditions like weather. Um, we'll take a look at weight and balance and loading. So like kind of talking about uh, center of gravity and how that's important. So after we discuss that, we'll talk about weight and balance calculations. So we'll first go over a couple of terms that are used in weight and balance, and then we're going to tie it into a sample scenario. So there's like two different methods we can use to calculate weight and balance that we'll try. And I've put together an Excel sheet that we're going to, I'm going to try to send it in the chat and we're going to try to do some of those together, uh, weight and balance using Excel basically. And time permitting, um, we've got takeoff and landing distance calculations that we can also try. Um, we can do any questions and I've also got some sample written test uh, prep at the end as well for this topic. All right, cool. So let's get started. So factors affecting performance. So one of the biggest ones that we have to take into consideration is atmospheric conditions, right? It's all about weather and stuff. So we know that air is light, um, but even though it's like super, super light, it does have mass and therefore it has a force that it exerts. Um, also it can be compressed or expanded, right? So density is gonna change. And something really important that we have to understand is density of the air or air density has significant effects on airplane performance. Um, so there's a pretty simple relationship to understand between these two things. So as air density increases, airplane performance increases and as air density decreases, airplane performance decreases there. So there's a direct relationship between those two factors. So, all right, we know that air density will affect performance, but how does air density change, right? Uh, so there's three main factors that we can discuss uh, that affect air density. Uh, the first one is altitude. So basically as we climb higher, as altitude increases, air density will decrease. And we know that as density decreases, this means you'll have a decrease in performance there. Uh, second factor is going to be temperature, right? So as temperature increases or as it gets hotter, um, your air density will decrease, which will lead to a decrease in performance. So I'm sure all you guys have you know, been flying around during these hot summer months, you'll notice that performance is not as great as a couple months ago, you know, when it was winter, when it was a little bit colder there. And finally, the last factor affecting air density is going to be humidity, right? So as humidity increases, your air density will decrease, which leads to a decrease in performance. And the main reason for that is the water molecules uh, that are replacing the oxygen are a little bit lighter, which will then decrease the density. So just to recap, right, we've got three factors affecting air density. That's altitude, temperature, and humidity. And as all those increase, your air density will decrease. So there's this fancy term that everybody likes to talk about when we talk about uh, density and airplane performance. It's called density altitude. Um, so if we look at you know, the book, there's just like technical explanation. We're not going to talk about that, uh, but I'll kind of give you guys like a simple definition to remember here. Density altitude is basically the altitude at which the airplane feels like it's flying at. Um, so we know that if we climb higher, right, as we gain altitude, air density will decrease, just like we talked about. And if air density is decreasing, this means that your performance will also decrease. And this will then translate into an increased or higher density altitude, right? The higher we go, um, we know that air density decreases, right? So that'll be like a higher density altitude there. Um, so the relationship between density altitude and performance is listed out here, right? So a high density altitude means you have lower or decreased air density. So that leads to decreased performance. And lower density altitude means, you know, the airplane feels like it's flying a little bit lower. So we have higher air density, which means increased performance, right? Increased performance. So again, um, that's density altitude and that's for three factors affecting the air density. So what we can do now, let's take a look at how our performance is actually being affected, right? We know that, all right, high density altitude means uh, decreased air density, so decreased performance, but let's take a look at the factors of performance that are really being affected. Um, so basically what's gonna happen is it'll affect three things, which are power, thrust, and lift. 
So we know that as the air becomes less dense, or in other words, we have a higher density altitude, um, you have a power reduction because the engine takes in less air. And additionally, thrust will be reduced because the propeller itself is actually not as efficient in the thinner air. And finally, the lift will also be reduced, right? This thinner, less dense air does not exert as much force on your different airfoils compared to if you had a lower density altitude, which is the denser air. So overall on the airplane itself, though, you'll have like increased takeoff distance, uh, increased landing roll distance, and you'll definitely notice a reduced rate of climb. So I'm sure you guys notice all these things right now if you've been flying in the uh, last couple of weeks since it's you know, super hot outside, density altitude is pretty high for the area just because of those three factors, right? We've got um, high temperatures and it's also super humid outside. So unfortunately, uh, people don't think sometimes and they don't take into consideration density and altitude and all these factors. Um, so there have been like accidents in the past due to density altitude. So there's this one video on YouTube. I think this video came out maybe like almost 10 years ago or something about this like uh, you know, in cockpit footage or something. Someone was filming from the right seat and they crashed basically into a forest. You know, everyone survived and everything. But um, I'm going to play this for you guys. There's basically a guy narrating throughout it to kind of explain the situation and we'll talk after. Um, but basically, they were taken off. I think it was like four people in the airplane, you know, a similar power output to what we have in the 172. Um, they're at a super high elevation, super hot outside, and it's very humid. So they like took a super long time to take off. And then once they became airborne, they actually touched back down again and then came back airborne and they barely climbed. So, all right, I'll just play the video here. Um, before I do that, let me uh, share the sound. So let's see. Everybody hear this stuff here? On August 4th, 2012, this video made it to the internet. What you're about to witness is a plane crash as it was experienced from the right seat inside the cockpit. The accident took place on Saturday, June 30th, 2012. At the time of this report, information was preliminary and subject to change, but some had been collected by the NTSB. The aircraft is a Stinson Model 108-3, generally a 165 horsepower single engine high wing propeller driven aircraft capable of carrying four plus full fuel and light baggage. An aircraft's performance is dependent, among other things, on the density of the air it moves through. And the aircraft appears to be operating from Bruce Meadows Airstrip, a 5,000-foot-long dirt and grass airstrip situated at an elevation of 6,370 feet, surrounded by 8 and 9,000-foot mountain peaks near the town of Stanley, Idaho. And that may be important. Watch what happens here. What you just saw was the aircraft skipping off the ground after having previously become airborne, only after prolonged ground rot. The aircraft seems unwilling to climb. We'll not speculate as to the cause of the crash, but it may nonetheless provide a good example of what pilots call a high density altitude takeoff. Cold, low altitude air is more dense. It's thicker than air found at higher altitudes and or higher temperatures. Moisture in the air, humidity, displaces air molecules and also acts to thin the air. For the pilot of a propeller-driven aircraft, thick air has its benefits. It gives the surfaces of the aircraft, the wings, and propeller more to push against, as it were. It gives a naturally aspirated non-turbocharged engine more air molecules to mix with fuel, and that results in higher power output. Relevant to what you're seeing here, the NTSB has collected air data, including barometric pressure, temperature, and moisture for the accident's location on the day of the crash. The figures show that while the aircraft was physically located at an elevation of 6,370 feet, the air around it was as thin as that found at 9,167 feet on a standard day. In other words, compared with a cooler day at a lower altitude, the engine of this aircraft had less air to mix with fuel. It put out less power while the propeller moved less air and produced less thrust. Meanwhile, the wings produced less lift for any given speed over the ground. In practice, that means the aircraft needed more land to get to speed and more speed to create lift, all the while working with less available power. It means it was harder for the aircraft to start to fly. Assuming that the pilot was attempting to climb, this particular aircraft appears strained at best and unwilling at worst. Whatever the cause, this was the result. All four men involved in this accident walked away. 
Early reports state that the pilot suffered the worst injury, including a broken jaw. Shown in slow motion, you can get a sense of how the airframe absorbed energy. Each impact with a tree lessens the amount of energy left for the final impact with the ground. The occupants were lucky. Once over the trees, there was very little the pilot could do. If faced with low airspeed and rising terrain, a turn was out of the question. At that point, riding it in might have been their best and only option. All right, so um, let me just stop staring sound there. Okay, so um, you can see pretty much all those factors that we were talking about uh, kind of cause that high density altitude, right? So they're super hot outside, they said, uh, high humidity, and their elevation was already like six or 7,000 feet. And I think they calculated the density altitude to be like over 9,000 feet. So just by looking at that, if you look at, you know, your takeoff and landing distances and your POH for the performance charts, you're gonna find that you have pretty much minimal climb performance there. So it's very important to understand those three factors affecting um, air density and how air density overall relates to performance, right? Just basically understanding, all right, decreased air density is decreased in performance there. So um, if time permits later on, we will talk about like calculating takeoff and landing distances as per the POH, but it's definitely something you wanna be able to do. Um, section five in your performance charts there. All right, so that's the uh, first factor affecting performance. And the next thing we'll talk about is weight and balance. So as pilots, we are the ones who are responsible for managing weight and balance, right? So there's a couple of different methods that we can use to do so, and we'll talk later about that. But we do have to understand that an overweight airplane will have really, really bad effects on almost every aspect of performance, right? Um, so if you look at the PHAC, they hey, list out like, I think it's 10 or so different things that um, will be affected here. So here's the whole list. You know, I'm not going to say every single thing, but you guys can kind of read this. Don't have to memorize it or anything, but um, it'll affect a lot of things, right? You'll have longer takeoff run, like we saw, you know, reduced rate and angle of climb, uh, reduced cruising speed and maneuverability. You'll have higher approach and landing speeds and longer landing roll. And you'll have excessive weight on either the nose or if you have a tail, uh, tail wheel in that case. So, um, that kind of brings me to the next point, right? So it's definitely important to talk about all right, overweight aircraft and how that can affect, you know, um, the performance, right? But we also have to discuss loading or kind of balance of the airplane. So an aircraft must be properly loaded or balanced to avoid structural failure. So when we talk about the word balance, we're referring to the location of what we call the center of gravity, the CG of an aircraft. So center of gravity or CG is the point at which the airplane would balance if it were suspended at that point. And when we discuss CG, we have to talk, it, uh, talk about it with reference to both the lateral and longitudinal axis of rotation. So I'm assuming some of you guys probably don't know what that is yet. So we will talk about that. Um, so yeah, before we you know connect center of gravity and stability, we do have to talk about those three different axes of rotation and also the types of stability uh, associated with each one. So if we go to this next slide, here's um, a couple of figures to help with this. So we've got three axes of an airplane or three axes of rotation. And the first one that we'll talk about is the lateral axis. So the lateral axis is basically running parallel from wingtip to wing, so wingtip to wingtip, and it runs straight through a center of gravity. So basically, if I look at this little airplane here and I take my pen, the uh, lateral axis is basically this over here. And about the lateral axis, the airplane is pitching up and down, right? So pitch is about the lateral axis. We control that with our elevators over there. So now we have the second axis, which is called your longitudinal axis. That basically runs from your nose all the way down to the tail, straight through your center of gravity. So basically my pen over here. And about the longitudinal axis, the airplane is rolling left and right, and that's controlled by your ailerons. So, so far lateral axis, right, that's pitching and your longitudinal axis is roll. And finally, we have the vertical axis, which runs straight through your center of gravity, basically top down. Um, and that's going to be yawing motion, right? So the aircraft yaws about the vertical axis, and that's controlled by the rudder over there. So again, there's another diagram on the bottom over here uh, showing the exact same thing. So again, longitudinal axis, which runs from your nose to the tail is roll. Uh, lateral axis over here, which is wing tip to wing tip is pitch. And finally, we've got the vertical axis, which is uh, yaw, so it's controlled by the rudders over there. 
So this next slide is uh, pretty similar in terms of information, right? We've got those three different axes of rotation and it's associated airplane movements and the primary control surfaces, right? However, there's a new column over here that we have to talk about. It's types of stability over here. So when we talk about airplane stability, let's just say, you know, we're flying straight and level, you know, holding altitude, holding heading, and aircraft stability is kind of the quality of the aircraft to return to its original uh, state of flight after, you know, its equilibrium is disturbed. So let's go back to that example, say we're, you know, in straight and level. Um, if we hit some turbulence or something, stability kind of refers to the aircraft's ability to return back to that straight and level configuration. So with that, you know, we're considering roll, we're considering pitch, and we're also considering yaw, which is where these three types of stability come into play. So lateral stability is all about roll, right? So basically airplanes rolling left and right, it's ability to kind of neutralize that out and go back to straight and level. So that's lateral stability. Um, it's kind of confusing to, to remember which axis of rotation is because it's kind of the opposite word. So lateral stability, which is roll, is about the longitudinal axis which runs from your nose to the tail. But if you just remember that lateral is for roll, and if you can kind of picture the longitudinal axis and figure out that the airplane rolls around that, you shouldn't have a problem um, kind of memorizing that. But of course, you know, you can draw out the table, kind of write that a couple of times. Um, the second type of stability that we'll talk about is longitudinal stability. That all has to do with pitch. So longitudinal stability is pitching. So like, you know, uh, climbing, diving, all that, and it'll kind of return back to straight and level flight. That's your longitudinal stability. Now, since that's pitch, the longitudinal stability is uh, associated with the lateral axis, right? We know the lateral axis is from wingtip to wingtip. So that's going to be pitch, which is longitudinal stability. Now, the last one is a little bit easier to remember. So directional stability, right? This is your yawing motion now. And that's about the vertical axis of rotation there. So yeah, it's sometimes confusing remembering like which type of stability goes with the axis of rotation, but it is the opposite. Um, but if you can understand the theory behind it with, you know, drawing out the longitudinal axis, seeing how the airplane rolls around that. And if you know lateral stability goes with the roll, that's pretty much the uh, best way to do that. So now that we've talked about, you know, your three axes of rotation and the types of stability associated with each one, um, let's now connect center of gravity with these. Uh, what just happened there? Just lost like all my slides. All right, let me just uh, go back here actually. All right, here we go. So um, let's first talk about center of gravity and lateral stability. So remember, lateral stability all has to deal with roll, rolling motion with your ailerons there. So lateral instability will cause wing heaviness, right? So does anybody, can anybody really think of two reasons why we may have lateral instability? So that's wing heaviness, right? So the rolling motion. Anyone, can you guys think of some reasons why we may have lateral instability? So let's see. I'm not sure if you guys know. Have, um, oh, there we go. All right. An uneven amount of fuel in one, you haven't changed the fuel cells. I mean, the, the fuel tanks, and you have more in one in the other. Yeah, exactly. And well, you got it, right? So you're flying the DA40, right? Exactly. So um, one tank has a little bit more fuel, one doesn't. Exactly. So that's one reason you may have lateral instability. Um, awesome. Anybody have one more possible reason? What about wind gusts? Um, so that'll just basically, you know, take the airplane out of its equilibrium. And when we talk about stability, though, we're, we're kind of thinking about how it'll return back and kind of respond to that. Um, but yeah, that could, that could definitely be something. So another thing I was thinking of here, right, is like uneven passenger or baggage loading, maybe you got, you know, a little more baggage or more people on the right side compared to the left side or something like that. So that can definitely be something for lateral instability. So definitely the easiest example though, what Enval was talking about, right? Like a mismanaged fuel load. So, um, if you're using the left tank too much compared to the right tank or something like that. So um, it's definitely important to talk about lateral balance, right? But longitudinal stability, which is your pitching motion, is way, way more important than uh, lateral stability. This is more critical. So you're going to notice that a very stable and controllable airplane will have extremely different characteristics if that center of gravity is too far forward or too far aft over there. So we'll talk about that. Um, so center of gravity too far forward will produce a nose-heavy condition. And a center of gravity that is too far aft will produce a tail heavy condition there. So we do have to understand though that either one of these can uh, put the airplane in an unstable condition and it can kind of become uncontrollable. So let's now take a look though at um, an airplane with forward loading versus aft loading. What kind of effects can we see here? So starting off with an airplane with forward loading, um, we've got these four effects to understand. And the first one is that you have a higher stall speed 
And the reason is your stalling angle of attack will be reached at a higher speed because you have increased wing loading, you know, pulling back to back wing a little bit more to hold altitude there. Um, you will also have a slower cruise speed. And again, that's just because we need a greater angle of attack to maintain that altitude since you have such a nose heavy airplane. And because we have a greater angle of attack, that'll mean also more lift, but increased drag as well, which is why we have a slower cruise speed. The airplane will also be more stable though. And the reason is your center of gravity will be farther forward from what we call the center of lift. Uh, the center of lift is just basically a point on your wings cord line where all the lift is concentrated. And if your center of gravity is a little farther forward from that, this will increase your longitudinal stability, which is again, the pitching motion, right? Uh, one of the problems, though, is that you may need greater back elevator pressure in certain situations, right? Just because you're so nose heavy, uh, you may have like a longer takeoff roll, higher approach speeds, and it may be a little bit more difficult to flare the aircraft when you're landing. So that's an airplane with forward loading. Um, so now what we'll do, we'll take a look at an airplane with aft loading. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit more dangerous, you know, it's kind of the opposite effects, but this condition is a little bit more dangerous here. Um, so you're going to get a higher cruise speed. But now with a tail heavy airplane, you'll need a smaller angle of attack required to maintain altitude, which means less drag. Um, your stall speed will now be lower because you have less wing loading. But the main problem is the aircraft is less stable. So even though our stall speed is lower, it may be pretty much almost impossible to recover from a spin or a stall because the airplane is so tail heavy. It basically as that center of gravity moves aft. So this is definitely the more dangerous condition. Um, so you do wanna be aware of the effects of a forward versus aft center of gravity on the airplane's performance. But how exactly do we control all this? Well, it's up to us basically, you know, uh, we the pilots, again, we're responsible for managing weight and balance and, and, you know, making sure that center of gravity was within limits there. So we always wanna be using, you know, that flight manual's approved methods and charts we never want to exceed their weights and CG ranges, right? So if you know you want to go fly um, premium mic and you want to take four people, full fuel, um, and you do your weight and balance calculations and you find out that you're over maximum takeoff weight, CG is not on limits, do not go flying. So that's pretty much all I've got for the uh, theory for factors affecting performance there. So, you know, there's a couple more to talk about um, that are listed in the private pod ACS, but you guys you know, definitely read on that in your own time, but those are the uh, more important ones there. So we're gonna now transition into weight and balance and kind of focus on this here. So before we talk about two methods we can use to calculate weight and balance and make sure we're good to go before flying, uh, we're gonna talk about some terms that are used in the weight and balance uh, calculations, just to make sure we're clear about the theory and not just you know uh, plugging in numbers and going. So the first term we're gonna talk about here, we've got something called a reference datum or just datum, um, it works too. It's basically an imaginary vertical plane or a little spot that the manufacturer sets on the airplane from which all horizontal distances are measured for balance purposes. So it's just some spot on the airplane and every item used for weight and balance purposes is measured from that point. So again, it's just like a reference point, that's all it is. And in the 172R, it's the lower portion of the front face of the firewall according to our uh, POH over there. So again, that's your reference datum. It's really just a reference point that they use and they measure everything from that point in terms of inches. You have something called station. So a station is just the location on your airplane fuselage of some item. And it's given in terms of distance from that reference datum. So for example, let's say you have those rear passenger seats in the airplane. The rear passenger seats are station 73. So station 73 is a location there. And that 73 is inches in distance, right? So that's your distance from your reference datum to that point. So it's basically saying, all right, those rear passenger seats are 73 inches uh, aft of your reference datum there. So that's a station. It's just a location and they give you the distance there. We've got something called arm here. And now this is just the horizontal distance in inches from your datum to the center of gravity and item. So you know how we just talked about station 73 for like the rear passenger seats? That 73 number is the arm right there. Arm is distance in inches. So it's basically just measuring from your reference point, the reference datum to whatever item you are, that number, which is your inches right there, distance is your arm. So we've got two other important terms also to take a look at, and there's something called moment. Uh, moment is just a force that causes or attempts to cause an object to rotate. So kind of a weird definition there, but it's more important for us to remember this formula. Uh, weight times arm equals moment. Easy way to remember this is WAM, W-A-M. Um, so we know weight is expressed in pounds arm is expressed in inches, right? That's just distance. So that means moments are expressed in pounds, inches over there. 
And we've got center of gravity again, just like uh, we've talked about previously. Um, so center of gravity, that's the point at which an airplane would balance if it were suspended at that point. And we will use the center of gravity equation or formula here later on for our second method of weight and balance calculations. So center of gravity, again, will be expressed in terms of distance or inches from that reference datum. And to calculate center of gravity, we're going to take your total moment and divide it by your total weight. So we're going to reference these two formulas a lot later on in our sample scenario, uh, but we'll continue checking out this image over here. So this is going to help tie everything together that we just talked about. So this first line over here is the datum or the reference date on this line. And it appears to be maybe it's the same thing like the uh, front face of the firewall there for this aircraft. And right below it, we see station zero, which makes sense, right? There's no distance from that item to the data because it's right on it. Um, however, take a look at this. We've got station 70 over here. Maybe this is like the um, rear baggage compartment or something. So that's station 70, just a location on the airplane's fuselage. And that 70 number is your arm, right? We're 70 inches aft of that reference datum. If your arm is positive, you're aft of the datum, but if you have a negative arm, we are somewhere in front of the reference datum, maybe like somewhere over here. So if we take a look at station 70, right, which may be like the rear baggage compartment like we're talking about, we see that there's a 10 pound weight over there at station 70. So if you wanna calculate the moment, we use that formula weight times arm equals moment. So the weight is 10 pounds and the arm is gonna be 70 inches. And if we multiply that, we get 700 there for the moment. Uh, now, looking at the top portion of the image, we have your center of gravity range. There's a forward limit, and there's also an aft limit. And when we calculate our weight and balance, we have to make sure that the center of gravity falls within these limits. We don't want that center of gravity to be uh, too extreme forward or aft, or otherwise we're going to see those effects that we were talking about earlier. So again, just a good image to kind of tie everything together in terms of those uh, terms over there, right? We had um, moment, we talked about station, we talked about arm, the reference datum, and the uh, center of gravity. So just a couple more things also to go over some basic definitions um, that you guys see in terms of the items. So usable fuel, uh, not all the fuel we put into those tanks can be used by the engine, but usable fuel is just whatever's available for flight planning or whatever can be used by the engine. Um, so in our 172R, that's gonna be 53 gallons. Uh, basic empty weight. So this is the weight of the standard airplane, any optional equipment installed, Unusable fuel, so that's three gallons for the 172R, and full operating fluids, including your full engine oil. So that's basic empty weight. So, you know, we don't have any people on board, there's no baggage, and there's no uh, usable fuel yet on board. Max ramp weight is the max weight approved for any ground maneuvers. So that could be like engine start, uh, taxiing, or fuel for run up. Now we have max takeoff weight, also pretty uh, self explanatory there. So, max takeoff weight is the max weight approved for the start of the takeoff run, start of the takeoff run. So if you look at your PO weight for the aircraft, you're gonna see probably that the max takeoff weight is just a couple pounds lower than the max ramp weight, just to account for the fuel allowance, you know, any fuel burned during that start taxi and run up there. So one more term here, useful load. So you now we talked about basic empty weight before, but now useful load, this is kind of what we're putting into the airplane. So it's the weight of the pilot and passengers, any baggage you're putting in and the usable fuel and also drainable oil. So basically useful load to calculate this is your ramp weight and you subtract your basic empty weight there. Um, you'll find that each aircraft that Princeton Flying School right now, all these are in the weight and balance records, but we have it you know, on one sheet for you know, useful load and moment for each aircraft. And we'll use that later actually. Um, so the rest of these three bullet points aren't necessarily definitions, but more so numbers that you guys should definitely remember, especially the first one here. So gas is six pounds per gallon. Six pounds per gallon is definitely something you want to remember there for the gas. Um, oil is 7.5 pounds per gallon as a standard number and water will say is 8.35 pounds per gallon. So all those numbers are important, but you definitely remember that the gas is going to be six pounds per gallon. We will use that later on for weight and balance calculations. So we're going to now check out the uh, POH here. So section six of the 172R POH is going to be your weight and balance slash equipment list. So we're not going to go through every single page, but I'm going to hop over to that uh, right over here. All right. So here's your table of contents, right? So you start off with an introduction. And the next section is for airplane weighing procedures. So if you actually have to figure out the basic empty weight and moment of your aircraft, you would follow those procedures. So it like tells you to how to prepare the airplane, you know, inflate the tires, move the seats forward, blah, blah, blah. But we don't have to do that for the aircraft, at least what we have right now. 
but the important section for us is the weight and balance. So this will describe the methods used to calculate weight and balance in the center of gravity. And after that, we have a comprehensive equipment list, anything that can be installed in the airplane there. So uh, if we scroll down a little bit, here's the introduction, and then there's your airplane weighing procedure. So again, if you guys wanna read that front, go right ahead. Um, but we're gonna skip that right now and move forward to the weight and balance. So it says, the following information will enable you to operate your Cessna within the prescribed weight and set of gravity limitations. To calculate weight and balance, use the sample loading problem, loading graph, and center of gravity moment envelope. That's a lot of words, so we're gonna break this down. Um, so going back to the slides, we're gonna talk about this first method here used to calculate weight and balance. Um, the FAA calls it the loading graph method. Uh, personally, I've never heard that you know they were actually named, but yeah, there are two methods. We'll call this one the loading graph method, and this is what we use for the POH anyways. Um, so what we're gonna do first, I'm gonna head back to the uh, POH and first um, show you guys this table called weight and I think it's moment tabulation over here. So taking a look at this, this is kind of like a worksheet we're gonna use here to calculate our weight, our takeoff weight and moment. So on the left, we have a column for different items. You start off by inputting your basic empty weight, then you have your usable feel, you know, passengers, baggage area. Then you add all that stuff up into ramp weight and moment. So then you add that up. And finally, we're gonna subtract uh, some fuel allowance for that engine start, taxi and run up. And then you get your final takeoff weight and moment. So again, we're just going through each item and you're gonna write your weight for each thing here. And how exactly do we figure out the moment though? So, you know, we, you're, you're gonna have the moment for your basic empty weight, right? You have your weight and moment. But for everything else to find the moment, we're gonna use something called a loading graph. So if we scroll down another two pages, here we go. We've got a loading graph. So let's say, you know, for the usable fuel, we had 200 pounds. So the way to do this, we have weights on your y-axis and then the moment on your x-axis. So we're going to go 200 pounds for the weight and draw a horizontal line across until we hit the diagonal for fuel, since that's what we're going for. Once you hit that diagonal line for fuel, you just go straight down and then boom, you have your moment right there. We'll just call it like, I don't know, 9.0, whatever. And then you write 9.0 in your moments over there. And then you kind of continue that process all the way down, right? So like for the pilot and front passenger, let's say, all right, we'll use this example. It was 340 pounds. We'll go back to the loading graph, find 340 pounds, and you go across until you reach the pilot and front passenger diagonal line, which is this first one. Then you go directly down and you find your moment. And I think uh, they said it was 12.6. Uh, so that's how that's going to work over there. So you continue that process again, and then you'll get that takeoff weight and moment. And with these two numbers, you're going to locate this point on what we call the center of gravity moment envelope. So it's just um, a couple pages down, this over here. And you'll plot your weight horizontally, you plot your moment vertically, and you find the intersection right there. And if your intersection is within this black envelope here, you're good to go. Your center of gravity is within limits. So I know right now there looks like normal category and utility category. We will talk about that later, but for our purposes for now, we just wanna make sure, all right, center of gravity is within the moment envelope there. So that's the first method of uh, calculating weight and balance. So it's kind of you know, hard to piece that together if we're not actually doing it. So I've got an Excel file that I put together, um, basically taking those charts and the weight and moment tabulation table, kind of putting that into Excel with the formulas. And we're gonna use that uh, together to try to do a sample weight and balance problem here. So here's the scenario. Uh, we're gonna be flying 298 Mike Trail. I've uh, taken weight the basic uh, taking the basic empty weight and moment from that sheet from uh, Princeton Flying School in our records. And we've got, you know, usable fuel is 40 gallons. Pilot and front passenger will be 250 pounds. Uh, rear passengers will be 150 pounds. And we'll have 15 pounds in baggage area one. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to see if I can go back to the chat here. And let's see. I'm going to try to share this file. All right, so let me know if you guys see that file and are able to download that. We're gonna to try to use this here. Um, all right, so I see a question from Sandra over here. What's the remedy if you need to make the flight? I'm assuming that's when I was talking about um, the factors affecting performance about you know if we're too heavy. Um, the answer would be stay on the ground so you're not gonna fly there or take out some more people, take out some more fuel. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you'll find out that it's just not gonna happen. Well, can 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 you do something if you have to make the flight? Uh, perhaps I don't know if this would be within limits, but mm -hmm. lean the mixture to draw more power, or uh, is there anything? 
I mean, within within reason. I mean, yeah, that's a good point. You're leading the mixture. Full rich, uh, though. But wouldn't, wouldn't you assume he was full rich? So, um, looking at the POH, we do have to. Um, they asked us to lean the mixture above three thousand, especially for cruising. You know, if you're going all the way up there. Um, but you know, if you look at those cruise performance charts, you have like the gallons per hours associated with each, you know, pressure altitude and whatever temperature you're going at. Um, but probably it's not going to make too much of a difference. And if it is, you're probably cutting it a little bit close. Um, so I probably wouldn't advise against them um, doing that. I mean, yeah, definitely lean out the mixed fuel save, you know, fuel or putting it richer, but um, yeah, probably it's not going to make such a huge difference there. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So were you guys able to access that Excel file there? I, I, I would be able to download it, except um, my computer is having an issue with Microsoft Excel. But it gotcha. looks like it was possible. Did everyone else try it and have a successful time? <laughs> yep, I got it. Cool. All right. So I want to see if I can transition the uh, I got it. here. All right. So I just tried resharing my screen. Can you guys see the Excel file now? Yep. Awesome. All right. Good stuff. So um, I've got that, you know, sample situation or example there on the bottom. And we're going to start off with the first method, which is your loading graph method, right? Um, so the table here comes directly from that POH that we had, you know, your item description. Uh, we enter in the weights and then you find the moments here using that loading graph. Um, so we're first going to start off with this first row, which is basic empty weight. And we're going to fill out this information and we have that information from um, the sheet here. So basic empty weight for the airplane for eight Mike Charlie is 1669.5 uh, pounds. So we're going to type that in here, 1669.5, boom. And for your moments now, we've got 65899, 65,899 pounds inches. But here's the thing though, for this column, we're actually not going to enter in the value. We want to put in a moment index, or in other words, we're going to take that moment and divide it by a thousand. And that's the number you want to use. And the main reason why we're doing that is just to make the calculations run a little bit smoother. It's kind of hard to deal with, you know, so many digits. So kind of just having one decimal point is a little bit easier to figure out. So we're going to take that 65, 899 and divide it by a thousand. And that's the number we'll uh, enter in here. So I'm going to type an equal sign 65899 slash or divided by 1000. And we'll get 65.9. And that's the value we'll enter in there for the moment for your basic empty weight. So that's the first step. And now the next step is we continue filling out each row using your weights that we have in the example. And then we're gonna use the loading graph here to figure out the moments, right? So usable fuel, we have 40 gallons of usable fuel, but the problem is we have to enter this in weight of pounds. Does anybody remember how to convert that 40 gallons into pounds here? What is that number gonna be? Isn't gallons 6.5? Plus, yeah, so it'll be six. So it'll be, six. it'll be six pounds per gallon. Exactly. So what's our value going to be here? Instead of writing in 40 gallons, how much? How many pounds are we going to write in here? 240. 240, you got it. All right, so we're going to write in um, 240 over there for the usable fuel and weight for the pounds. Now, moment. All right, we don't have that in an example right there, but we're going to use the loading graph to figure this out. Um, so, you know, you're going to draw the line at 240 horizontally. And when that intersects with your field, we'd go straight down and you read off the moment and enter that in. I find it's easier to do this using a rectangle shape just because um, it's a nice vertical line already. So I'm going to position this to start at the 240 line over here uh, for your weight, since we have 240 pounds of usable fuel. We'll drag it across until it hits the fuel diagonal line, which is the second one over here. And once it hits that, I'm going to go straight down and assuming that we're right at the intersection there. And then if you read straight down, there's your moment. So um, I'm seeing maybe about 11.5. You know, it's not going to be super perfect, but about 11.5 there for the moment index there. So that's how we do that. So now I'm going to type in 11.5 for the moment. And now we just continue the process going all the way down, right? So pilot and front passenger, they're not going to give that to us in gallons. So that's good. Uh, we have pounds. So we're going to write in 250 pounds in this example over here. And now same thing with the moment, right? We're going to, I'm going to draw a rectangle here. So it's a little bit easier. 
250 pounds on the loading graph. We'll go horizontally until we hit the pilot and front passenger diagonal line, which is this first one here. And once it intersects that line, we're going to go straight down and then we read the moment on the um, X axis over there. So we'll probably say maybe like 9.3 ish, somewhere around there. You know, it's not going to be perfect, but we'll say 9.3. And we'll write that in for the moment. Anybody have any questions so far about this process? All right, good, good here. So um, continuing on, we got rear passengers, 150 pounds. So we'll type in 150. And for the moment, the same deal, but now the rear passengers, this is the third of the diagonal lines here. So I'll find the 150 pounds and we'll draw across until we hit rear passengers and go straight down. Um, let's look at like pretty much exactly 11.0, I think is what I'm looking at. All right, so 11.0. Now baggage area one, we've got 15 pounds. So we're at 15 pounds. It's gonna be kind of hard to figure that out you know, too precisely. I mean, we could zoom in, but it's not gonna make too, too much of a difference. Um, so we'll find 15 pounds, which is somewhere around here, where it intersects with baggage areas one line, which is that second to last one. So I'm gonna say it's like 1.5, it's somewhere around there. And we have nothing in baggage area too. So we're just going to leave that blank or we'll type in zero for the uh, weight moment, whatever you want to do. So now what we have to do is add up all the weights and the moments and you will get your ramp weight in moment. Remember, that's the maximum uh, weight approved for any ground maneuvers, right? Your engine start, taxi and run up. So the max ramp weight for the aircraft, 172R is 2,457 pounds and we're showing 2,324.5 pounds within limits there. So now if you want to get to takeoff weight in moment, we have to remember there's a fuel allowance for that engine start taxi and run up. And per the POH, they subtract seven pounds. So we're going to do the same thing. And the moment is subtracting 0.3. So then you'll get your final takeoff weight in moment of 2,317.5 pounds. And your moment is 98.9 for the index there. And that is within your gross uh, your max takeoff weight there, you know, the 2,450 pounds. So cool. Um, that's filling out this table, right? We have know we know that the weight is within limits, but now how do we figure out if the center of gravity is within those limits? So here's where that center of gravity moment envelope comes into play. So this is also you know, directly taken from the POH. So we're gonna remember these two numbers, take off weight and moment. And we're gonna go to this CG moment envelope, this next uh, worksheet over here. So I've kind of taken a screenshot, copying that CG moment envelope little, uh, chart into the Excel file. And there's our total weight and moment appearing. So what we have to do now, we have to plot two lines and find the intersection and verify if it's within um, the envelope. So we're going to insert a line over here and we'll do weight first. So the weight is on your Y axis. So we're going to draw a line at 2317.5 pounds. Pretty hard to do that accurately considering uh, what we're looking at over here, but we'll kind of estimate somewhere around here. I'm just gonna increase the weight so it's a little bit easier to see on the screen. And we're gonna do the same thing for the moment, but now we'll do it vertically. So insert a line. Moment was 98.9 over here. And remember that value is, um, we have to multiply a thousand if we wanna get the actual number. So 98.9, somewhere around here on the bottom, the X axis, and we'll draw our vertical line up. I'll make that a little bit easier to see here. And there we go. So now you've got the intersection of these two lines and there's your point. And you see that it's within the envelope for the normal category. So that means your center of gravity is within limits and you're good to go. So that's the first method of calculating weight and balance, right? We determined that your uh, takeoff weight is good by using the weight and moment uh, tabulation, this chart here, using loading graph. And then we use the moment envelope to determine if the CG is within limits there. So um, some of you guys may not know what this normal category or utility category stuff means over here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to switch screens back to the presentation. We'll go over that quickly. And then we're going to talk about the second method. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that your own proprietary Excel spreadsheet? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. If it was available anywhere. Uh, I think we can probably make this available somehow. I'll, I'll talk to see if we can probably figure that out. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. All right, so let me see if I can reshare the uh, screen to the other. Okay, here we go. So back to the uh, presentation slides over here. So um, talking about normal and utility category, basically it's just like, what can you do with the airplane? Uh, so normal category, flying in the normal category, this is intended for non-acrobatic operations. So like normal flying maneuvers, 
um, most of your stalls and like commercial maneuvers, like lazy eights, chandelles, steep turns, that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're flying utility category, this is like limited acrobatic operation. So it may include spins, that kind of sort of stuff. So I think if you look at the POH for the 172R, it says if you want to fly in the utility category, there's like lower weight limits um, and you have to like have nothing in the rear seats, empty baggage compartment, something like that. Um, so going back to now the other Excel sheet. So if you look at that envelope, right? Um, our intersection is in normal category, so we're good to go. But we cannot fly in utility category, so we cannot be doing you know intentional spins here. Um, it looks like if we want to be flying within utility category, total or max near our takeoff weight at least can't exceed 2,100 pounds, and the moment's got to be somewhere within here. So that's just kind of the explanation there. So usually, though, all of it's going to be normal category for uh, what we're doing there. So awesome. That's the first method of uh, weight and balance calculations. Does anybody have questions about using the loading graph or the uh, moment envelope there? All right, so that's good to hear. So one question, Wes. Oh, we got one question. All right, yeah, go ahead. If you're on a flight and your flight's gonna take you to the edge of all of your usable fuel, right? You're gonna have a change in like in loading, right? So how do you account for that when you're, you know, you've got passengers and CG movement? That's a very, very good question, right? So what you can do, you can calculate weight and balance for your landing as well as you would, you know, subtract the fuel you're going to use and do the same thing and then just plot the point again and see if you're going to be within the center of gravity. Um, for us, though, it's not going to be too much of a big deal because our fuel tanks are pretty much right around the center of gravity. So it's not going to change too, too much. Um, but that's how we're going to kind of approach that. So also, in addition to doing the takeoff, calculate your weight and balance and tune you for the landing, right? So, you know, just have less fuel, but everything else will remain the same there. Uh, does that make sense, Envol? Yep, thank you. You got it, awesome. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the uh, slides now, a lot of uh, swapping of screens. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about the second method now that we can use for uh, calculating weight and balance. It's very similar, um, you're not too different. I mean, the FAA calls it manual computational method. Fancy name there. Um, it's really not that fancy though. So pretty similar process. You know, we'll start off with taking that basic empty weight in moment. We'll record it in the first um, row over there. But instead of using the loading graph to find your moment, we're going to use that equation we talked about earlier. That formula: weight times arm equals moment. So to find the arm of each of those items, we'll look at the POH. So I'll show you guys where to find it. But yeah, we're just using that equation now instead of using the loading graph. So some people prefer this, some people, you know, prefer loading graph method, whatever works. And what you're going to do is the same, you know, kind of after that, you total the weights and moments, and then you determine if the weights are within limits. But instead of using that CG moment envelope chart, we're going to use a CG limit chart. So we actually have to calculate the center of gravity this time. So we'll use that um, formula total moment divided by total weight. Then we'll plot the values of your weight and center of gravity, find the intersection and same deal, determine if your loading is acceptable there. So we're going to try it using that exact same scenario, and you're going to find you're going to get the same exact results. So, you know, both are acceptable. Uh, so same scenario that you can find in the Excel sheet. So I'm going to go back to the Excel sheet over here with the screen sharing. All right. So we're now going to go to the manual computations, uh, which is the third worksheet or third workbook over here on the bottom. Um, so all right, method two, manual computations. Can everybody see this okay here? Sounds good. So. Um, what you can see, I've added a new column over here for the arm, right? Since we're going to use that formula weight times arm equals moment um, to figure out the moment. So to start off, um, we'll do the same thing. You know, basic empty weight and moment, we'll fill that out. So we know the basic empty weight for eight mic Charlie was 1669.5. And the moment was 65899. But remember, we have to divide that uh, value by 1000 for this um, column here for this chart. So equal sign 65,899, and we're gonna divide it by 1,000. And there's your moment index of 65.9. So now usable fuel, right? It, we said 40 gallons. So I think, you know, multiply it by six, like we talked about for the conversion, and we'll get 240 pounds. So now to figure out moment, we've got to use that formula weight times arm equals moment. But how do we figure out the arm? You know, how far back is, you know, that usable fuel tanks, the fuel tanks from your reference datum? So there's a figure in the POH that appears before that weight balance or weight and moment tabulation chart. And it looks just like this, this image here on the right side, you guys can find uh, figure six dash three. It's called loading arrangements. And it gives you the different stations for each of these items. And remember the number is your arm. 
So like the rear passengers, uh, the arm is 73. So you would use 73 for that. So you guys, we don't see fuel over here, right? But we see there's some notes. The first note says the usable fuel center of gravity arm for the integral tanks is located at station 48. So if that's station 48, what's the arm we're gonna type in here? 48. 48, and there you go, exactly. So 48 inches back from the reference datum, and boom. Now we're just gonna go to the moment uh, cell over here, D5, and we multiply those two values. But remember, we have to get this value divided by a thousand for this. So I'm gonna press equal sign. We'll click that first cell B5, um, asterisk for multiply, and we'll click C5, try five for the arm. So right there, that's weight times arm. But now we have to divide this value by a thousand. So we're gonna type that in as well just like that and press enter. And there's your moment, we get 11.5. So if we compare this back to the loading graph method, I think we have the exact same value. So that worked out pretty well. Um, so you're gonna see it's gonna be uh, pretty similar if not exact same. So now same thing, we're gonna continue all the way down. Pilot and front passenger, we've got 250 pounds. What value are we gonna enter here for the arm for pilot and front passenger? Anybody have a guess? Thirty-seven. Yeah, so we're gonna use thirty-seven. Um, you're gonna see though, there's like a star next for it and below it, thirty-four to forty-six. That's actually accounting because you know how these seats can move back and forth. The range is from thirty-four to forty-six, but they said the average position of these seats is thirty-seven. So we'll use thirty-seven inches. Does that make sense there? All right, cool. So um, yeah, we'll do thirty-seven inches and same deal. I'm just gonna drag that calculation all the way down just to make it easier for ourselves later. So, all right, 9.3 for the moment index. We look back, um, all right, so far looking good. Same exact numbers. Continuing down, we've got rear passengers. So 150 pounds. What number are we gonna input over here for the arm? Remember that's your distance in inches. Seventy-three. 73. Cool, all right, a couple people got it. You got it, yeah, 73 inches there. And then we get 11.0 for the moment index. Same thing before. So yeah, you guys can see it's gonna be the exact same result pretty much. Um, baggage area one, we've got 15 pounds. But now if we take a look at baggage area one, there's a couple numbers. So 108 is the rear, but then 95 again is kind of the center of baggage area one. So we'll just use that number. Um, so 95 inches after your reference data, we'll put that for the arm. And we get 1.4 for the moment. I think we had 1.5 before, so. A little bit different, but it's not gonna make too much of a difference there. And baggage area two, we've got nothing over there. But if I did have something in baggage area two, what value would I enter in for the arm? 123. 123, you got to involve exactly. So that's how we're gonna do this. So we'll leave that baggage area two blank. But next, it's pretty much the same thing, right? We've added up the ramp weight and moment. Um, that's within your maximum ramp weight. And then for the fuel allowance, we're gonna subtract that seven pounds. Um, so to figure out the moment though, we can do the same thing, right? So the fuel tanks was 48, station 48. So we're gonna do arm, it's 48 inches and do that same formula. So weight multiplied by the arm divided by 1000 minus 0.3. Same thing like we got from the POH there. So there's your takeoff weight and moment. So your takeoff weight is within limits there. So now one additional step we've got to do is calculate the actual center of gravity. We didn't do that before, but now we do have to do it. So if we remember the formula for center of gravity is total moments divided by total weights. So you've got your moment right here and you've got your weight. But the problem is, remember, this is a moment index. We have to multiply that now by a thousand to get the true value for your moment. And then you divide by a weight. So that's what I've got in this cell. Um, so it's like D12, 98.7, multiply by a thousand to convert it back to your true number. And then we divide by your takeoff weight. So then we get the center of gravity is 42.59 inches aft of your reference datum. So that's how we do uh, that part. We calculated, you know, gross weight is good. And now we've got to figure out if center of gravity is within limits. So we're going to remember the takeoff weight in CG. And now we're going to hop over to the CG limits. So this is the fourth worksheet here. And now we've got the center of gravity limits uh, chart. So you're going to find this also in the um, POH. It's the chart right after the loading graph and moment envelope that we looked at after. And it kind of works the same way. So the weights will plot that line. And we're going to plot the CG line and make sure that the intersection is within the envelope, right? So weight is 2,317. We'll say somewhere around there. We're going to make this a little easier to see. 
And center of gravity, we said 42.59 inches. It's gonna be pretty hard to plot that accurately, but somewhere around here. Plot that up and we'll get that a little easier to see. And boom, now we've got the intersection of your two lines. And we can see that it is within the envelope for your normal category. So we're good to go in that sense. So again, with weight and balance calculations, there's two methods, right? We've got the loading graph, or you can do your manual computations using those formulas, um, but they're gonna give you the exact same results, right? We're just looking to make sure that your gross weight is uh, within limits and that your center of gravity is not uh, you know, exceeding limits as well there. So anybody have questions though about the manual computation method over there? Hey, Wesley, what if- Yeah, what's up, Lori? What if you wanted to turn baggage area one into two into one thing? Say you have golf clubs and a surfboard and longish objects, um, can you just use the, 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 the middle number between one and two? Yeah. So that's exactly um, what I would think as well. So if you go you back do? to, yeah. yeah. So going back to this, right. So one here's baggage area one and two. If, yeah. Right. If you have something super long, I'd probably use 108 there. Does that make yeah, sense? Okay. Yep. That's, that's a pretty good question. And, and that shows you, you got it. So exactly. Yeah. That would make sure. sense. Hey, Wes, I do have a question, right? So because the mm -hmm. arms for the baggage areas are ranges, is it reasonable mm -hmm. to assume that if your baggage shifts around that it'll still keep you within the tolerance or do you have to secure your, uh, your baggage? That's a good question. Um, well, first of all, you do want to make sure that the baggage is pretty secure and not moving around, but it shouldn't affect it too much just because it's a relatively small range. Um, but maybe there's a note in the POH somewhere about that, but um, it, it won't have too much of a factor because the maximum weight in the baggage area combined is only 120 pounds. So it's not like there's going to be too many things yeah. back there anyways. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? So, um, yeah, we'll probably pause for the content in terms of that. So we won't cover the, um, you know, takeoff landing distances, but we'll try that another time. But yes, yeah, anybody have questions about anything we talked about today? So, you know, we talked about factors affecting performance. We talked about, you know, like air density, um, weight and balance, loading, and then we did our two methods of weight and balance there. Um, in, in the review for the, the crash, uh, did the NTSB find that the guy never checked the density altitude? That's a good question. I have no clue. Um, I would yeah. like to figure that out though, but I'm assuming he, I mean, I shouldn't assume, but uh, there's a chance he probably didn't. Uh, but you definitely, you know, want to be taking a look at that stuff. So like when you calculate takeoff and landing distances and the right. POH, you're going to see that all those charts are based on something called pressure altitude, but then you also have to find like the right column to use and that's based on temperature. So, you know, that's thinking about density altitude right there. Hmm. Um, also like going on four flight or something or listening to um, AWAS, you also may hear like density altitude at the end being reported. Uh, but yeah, four flight uh, as a source too. kind of all those things work. And you said the runway was 5,000 feet. Um, something like that. It was, it was pretty long and you saw that like long, they, yeah. They, yeah, they used a lot of it and they, they even came back down once. Yeah. So yeah, wow. density altitude, do not want to mess with that stuff. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have uh, any other questions here? Oh, I, I have a question. Would, um, yeah. uh, in that kind of scenario, in order to increase, uh, your angle of, uh, uh, your, your angle of climb, would you would he have used like 10 degrees of flaps to get up faster um no not really i mean it's you're gonna see that it's just not gonna do much i mean you're gonna be barely climbing um okay i know on short field be, takeoff yeah, yeah, short, yeah. We, we've done you know nate and i have i've you know we've been on short runways where we do put 10 degrees of flaps up and you know it's to help your your angle of climb right Right. Yeah. I mean, that's up for you to try. I mean, it's just that you're going to see that the performance though itself is just going to be garbage. Still, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, the airplane will probably just give up at that point. But I mean, flying here, you know, density altitude is probably never going to get to a point where it's like, oh man, I'm right, running right. out of runway if you're at a decent size runway, but um, still definitely something important to kind of figure out. All right. Any more questions here? Oh, okay. I, I forgot to mention there's one more uh, sheet on the bottom of the Excel. Um, and this is just the aircraft at the, at the school, kind of all there. Type the empty weight, moment, and useful load, um, if you ever need to reference that when you're doing your calculations. But these things do change, you know, if we're, you know, installing the avionics or doing something like that. So um, these will probably not be the most accurate within the next year or something. All right. Well, looks like uh, no more questions as of now. Um, are there, do, do, um, for, do for flight in some apps 
computate this automatically for you if you just yeah it. it seems to me like i understand the principles behind learning the math and like you know the science and computating like i get it it's important but if you're just kind of in a rush and you don't want to do all of this can you just put <laughs> it in and get the answer yeah exactly so that's exactly it's fine um so right for flight you, there's a weight and balance uh, tab so if i pull that up um you can like enter in different aircraft so you can like type in literally 298 mike charlie and it'll pop up as 172 or and get it set up and you would just have to enter in what you see here the basic empty weight in the moment and you can do the same thing you know you load your front seats the fuel tanks aft seats baggage area and there's like a summary tab and it'll give you the actually you know the envelope itself so um let me see if i can like share it's gonna work um we see that so like i got a notification okay um, you can actually do it though. Yeah. in four flight, you know, it'll plot oh, yeah. the, where, wherever you're on the envelope. If you set it up, it's so, like at a load loading, you can load in different passengers, select, you know, weights and all that and baggage. But then if you go to summary, yeah, it'll automatically do it, which is a uh, pretty useful there. So definitely. Yeah. You, you know, you, you do want to understand the concepts behind it and be able to do it manually, but yeah, if you're in a rush, I mean, why not? It's right there. <laughs> do it. That's a very good question though. Very good question. So Wesley, on the four flight one, does it also, if you're if you have a route you're going, let's say you're you're doing a cross country and you're stopping mm -hmm. at multiple airports, does it give you the ability to say, okay, at airport number one, passenger one passenger leaves and my fuel should be X? Does it still check, or can it help you check that, or do you have to just manually do all each step? Yourself. I think you would have to manually type retype in those numbers on okay. on four flip, but it's, it's still pretty quick in terms of doing yeah. it. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can just type it in and do it. But yeah, I don't think at least I'm not sure. Maybe does someone know if there's like an answer to that? Like you can automatically do that. I'm not 100 sure, though. All right. Cool. Is that it, nice. Wesley? Yeah, that's all I've got for the content. I mean, we'll, we'll stop there. That's I think that's, cool. a, that's a good amount. But yeah, hopefully that Excel sheet is uh, useful for you guys to, to work. But yeah, four flight, if you got that too, that's pretty fast. So why not? Awesome. Um, before everyone runs off, just want to remind you that Saturday we're going to have barbecue from 12 to 3. And if it rains, we're going to be in the hangar, so we'll still have it. And you guys are awesome for coming and watching this live. I know people have come and made comments that they're, uh, they'll are they watch the recording and stuff, but seriously, you make the experience that much better. So thanks yes. for being here. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Wesley. Yeah, thank and Wesley, always, always amazing. Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thanks, Wesley. Thanks, of course. Yeah, yeah. it's great to see everybody. Thanks, uh, see, thanks for all tuning in. <laughs> see you Thursday. See you Thursday. Yeah, I'll see you guys. Oh, yeah, all right. Sounds good. I'll see you then. Cool. <laughs> we'll see you all soon. Have a great day. Bye. Awesome. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, Bye, -bye. Wesley. All right. Bye, see you later, Thanks. Take care, everybody. Yeah.